Um, and uh, we have this, this, what I think is a beautiful picture. It's number seven uh, for our guy Greg to put up. But um, why, don't we, uh, why don't you talk about that? That was uh, taken about 100 years after uh, the Charter, 1882 or so. Right. Uh, it's maybe self-explanatory, but I'm sure you could talk about it. It's, uh, all I really know about it is that it's, it's a shot from uh, the troop that we have dated at 1882. It's one of the oldest photos that we have of, uh, of the troop in formation. And um, it's, uh, it, it's one, of our, one of our favorites. I just, uh, I just think it's pretty striking the way everybody's formed up and uh, you know, the history in it is, uh, is pretty reflective. No, it is. It sure is. Um, and you mentioned, um, and we'll go to maybe um, number nine, but you mentioned the first time that you were federalized was the search for Pancho uh, Villa. Right. And uh, the uh, number nine is uh, a photo that was taken right around that time. That's right. That's what, what, what the guard would have looked like. Um, in, in 1917. And, and the, and the interesting thing is not, not very much changed, obviously, in terms of, uh, of uniform and equipment between actually 1917 and the 1940s. Our troop still uses the same kind of equipment, and our, our uniforms are pretty reminiscent of that uh, with some modern adaptations. Um, our uniforms recall the U.S. Cavalry of the 1940s. Obviously, in the 1940s, the U.S. Cavalry uh, became mechanized, mm -hmm. um, but we retained our status as a an active cavalry unit under the National Guard, and um, we're the house. We consider ourselves to be the the living uh, home to the U.S. cavalry traditions that uh, sort of parted from the U.S. Army at that time. We keep all those traditions alive there. We uh, all of our drills are right out of the U.S. Cavalry Manual. All of our horse-mounted maneuvers you can find them in the U.S. Cavalry Manual from that time. Uh, we drill on McClellan saddles, um, which are the saddle that was developed by General George McClellan uh, just prior to the Civil War, and with some minor adaptations to it since then. Uh, the saddle hasn't changed since the 1940s. That's, that's great that you are a, uh, a store of, of history, as it were, and that, as you say, through the years, there's been so many changes in warfare and defense and such, but you really do harken back to another time. It's true, and uh, we have the lone distinction in the United States. We are the oldest continuously active mounted cavalry unit in the whole United States, and that's, uh, I think, a pretty great distinction for Connecticut to have. It's a fabulous distinction. Um, some people are wondering if, if you guys would be available to um, recapture the notch that uh, <laughs> Massachusetts <coughs> may have uh, taken from us uh, the north border there. If, um, if, uh, if those orders came down, <laughs> do our right, best. Right, well. <laughs> Uh, now, well, are there other, uh, there are horse guards, though, in other states, obviously. There are. You know, the ones that I'm aware of um, in terms of a, a governor's horse guard are in New Hampshire, uh, and I believe Pennsylvania has one, but they don't actually call it a governor's horse guard, but they are a, a state militia um, horse-mounted unit that's very similar to ours, but they have different traditions, obviously, and different right. past. Now, do you have, uh, are there sidearms or weapons that you train with? Uh, our unit does train uh, on uh, 45 calibers, uh, M1 Garand rifles, mm -hmm. and uh, M16. And uh, we do that usually at Camp Rel, uh, annual training, and periodically we have, um, we have firearms training for our, our troopers. They all qualify in firearms. And it's a, I mean, it's a pretty physically demanding, and, and, sure. and one uh, needs to have a fair amount of skill. Uh, That's true, you know, and uh, when we take on a recruit, um, we do a recruit class every March that runs until August. Um, a lot of the recruits don't have a military background and they don't have a horse background. I actually fall into both of those categories. I didn't have prior service and nor was I much of a horseman at that point. Um, some would argue I'm not still. Depends <laughs> on who you talk to. Uh, but uh, we, we train everybody who comes in, um, both in military drill and ceremony uh, and in uh, Horse, military horsemanship, which is uh, completely different than standard horsemanship. Uh, in fact, some of the toughest times we'll have with a recruit who has a lot of horseback experience is sort of breaking them of some of the habits that they might have from one reason or another uh, from their past experience right. and, and, and having them do things the cavalry way. Um, but uh, sure, it's, it's a demanding thing. Uh, all our troopers are volunteers. 
Um, they don't get paid for their service, and it requires a lot of time and money for all the participants to, to be involved with it and uphold this tradition for the state. <coughs> now you, um, the, the first company, Governor's Horse Guard, is also a, uh, a certified mount search and rescue team. Is that correct? We're in the process right now of becoming the, uh, the state's only certified mounted search and rescue team. Um, we've in the past uh, been available for call out for search and rescue uh, operations and we have been called out uh, but right now we're moving to a higher level of skill and knowledge and capability. Um, we've just completed uh, back in February a uh, search and rescue training uh, for it was three days in February which was uh, run by Gordon Snow who's a former Royal Canadian Mounted Police Officer and uh, some folks from CSAR, the Connecticut Canine Search and Rescue. Um, I had 23 troopers taken past that course. Uh, later in July, I'm going to have uh, two three-day weekends of training for those same 23 troopers uh, in something called FUNSAR, Fundamentals of Search and Rescue. And uh, on top of that, 20 hours of land navigation training, uh, a course in crime scene preservation, and uh, also uh, CPR and first aid certification. And that's just to qualify us on the ground level. Uh, after that, we have to be evaluated by the nearest uh, horseback mounted search and rescue team, which would either probably be in Maine or Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, to get some, uh, get some certification in uh, large animal first aid. After that, uh, we'll be certified as uh, a mounted search and rescue team. The goal with that is to become part of uh, ESF-9, that's Emergency, Cer uh, emergency, Cer uh, emergency Cer Search Function 9. I'm sorry, it's Emergency Services Function 9. Uh, out of uh, CREPC, the Capital Region Emergency Preparedness Committee. And uh, they're the only search and rescue uh, function in the whole state of Connecticut. So even though the state's divided into about five or six districts for this, we would be available statewide uh, as a mounted search and rescue team. And it, it, it's pretty important to have one. Um, many states have them. Over 30 states have a mounted search and rescue team available. There's terrain when you're searching for someone that can't be accessed by people on foot or by mechanized vehicle uh, terrain that horses can cover uh, much easier, much faster. Sure, there's, there's a lot of land uh, in Connecticut. I mean, you wouldn't think, I mean, some people would not think that there is, you wouldn't think of Connecticut as a wilderness state, but there are, are pockets of it that are extremely dense and, uh, and very wilderness-like. Sure, sure. A lot of nooks and crannies and it's a nuanced Lots of people get, get lost every year. I'd say there's probably, what I understand is there's about 24 uh, roughly per year in the state of Connecticut. Really? Um, searches that go on. That's a, uh, every couple of weeks then. There's a, yeah. yeah. Now, how would that work? You guys are stationed out of Manchester? Avon. Avon. Mm -hmm. um, I should have cue cards, I guess, <laughs> to uh, follow. So you're out of Avon. Right. And um, if there was, let's say, in Sleeping Giant State Park or uh, Kent Falls, mm -hmm. to do something that's closer to the viewers, um, would you, I wouldn't accept, uh, expect that you'd hop on your horse in Avon and Paul no. Rivera it down 84 to, um, you know, uh, to Ken No, Falls. I mean, the, the idea is obviously first, before we, um, before we go online as a search and rescue team, uh, we're going to be entering into a memorandum of understanding between ourselves and CREPC, uh, that is the military department and CREPC, uh, provided that goes without a hitch. Um, the way, uh, a search and rescue such as that might work is uh, once someone uh, there's a search going on for someone we would be one of the uh, one of the elements called on in the search one of the one of the tools in the toolbox um, we would come down we trailer the horses um, you know we would picket them uh, at a proper air staging area and then uh, you know we would await direction from the the person who's the incident commander and and you have uh, the trailers uh you would need to, you, you, don't, you have 45 horses? You don't have 45 horses. No, we don't have, four, I wish we had 45 horses. No, uh, right now we have uh, 21. When I first joined the troop, we had 38 horses. Uh, we're down to 21, obviously, with the state uh, budget situation. We've had some, some significant reductions. Uh, now, does that, forgive me, but is that lost by attrition, or you just can't, the, the, the financially you've been cut, so you've had to we do sell it by, off We do horses? it by attrition. Um, the order has been to do it by attrition, and the way we do that is we'll adopt the horses out, um, usually the ones that are older and have reached the end of their natural service life to us. Um, they become 
usually a great companion horse is somebody who has a, a younger, healthier horse that they're using as a primary riding horse and they just want a horse that uh, accompanies the horse. Sure. Uh, they'll adopt that out. Uh, they get adopted and usually sent to a good home. We try to make that happen. Uh,